Hey there, plant nerds. I know it's been a little bit since I've done some videos, but I've had some folks asking me if I was going to do any tiny plant unboxings. And what do you know? I just happened to get an itty bitty box of itty bitty plants yesterday from California Carnivores. Now, this is not a sponsored uh, video or post. This is just uh, one of the many wonderful online plant vendors that I love to buy plants from. So they happen to have some pygmy sundews in stock. You might have seen me post about that um, a couple of weeks ago. They had a limited um, selection. So of course I, I had to snag some. I am obsessed with pygmy sundews. They are a very teeny, teeny tiny group of carnivorous plants. You can see, you can barely see the plant in there. I'm going to show you a, a close up. Um, but as you, as you might know, very tiny plant species can be very challenging to grow on an open air culture windowsill. Most of them really, you know, end up needing a lot more humidity than you can provide in your natural home environment. So you've got to go under glass, under closed jars or in terrariums, not pygmy sundews. Um, surprisingly, these very tiny species do really well uh, in open air culture on a bright sunny windowsill or on a grow shelf with supplemental grow lighting. Um, if you get the watering regimen right. Uh, and I'll talk about that. And I talk about it in my book if you wanna read more about how to care for these plants or you can go to any of the plant vendors websites. They have a, a ton of great education. But I'm gonna um, unpack some of these. It's gonna take a little minute to, to get some of this tape and the cover off and then I'll walk you through each one of the six species that I was able to snag in this order of itty bitty tiny pygmy sundews. Just a little note on unpacking plants um, when you receive them in the mail. Make sure to unpack them right away. You know, sometimes plants can be in transit for several days and in the dark, closed up. And with little plants like this, often you will have them arrive with cellophane, you know, very tightly wrapped around the base of the plant to keep all of the substrate in and then may have a little dome cover uh, over them as well. So you want to unpack these and take these off so that the plants get air exposure, um, oxygen exposure, and start getting some light as soon as possible. And follow whatever instructions that the plant vendor includes because different plant species are going to have different requirements. The first species I'm going to show you is Drosera scorpioides. Um, this is a cool looking little species and as you can see how tiny they are. Here's my finger and this is a mature plant right here. Um, this species is has kind of a reputation for being one of the big guys. So it's, it's kind of called the giant among pygmy sundews because it can actually get a few inches tall. Not, not really a whole lot wider so it kind of has a very tall skinny growth habit. The lower leaves and traps will sort of die off as the, the plant grows to a taller canopy. It ends up looking like a little tiny forest. Um, these usually last about a good two years. The individual uh, plant will die off about um, the end of its second growing season, but they do make large gemmae. Gemmae are the little uh, vegetative clone propagules that you can collect, not seed, but vegetative clone propagules. They usually make these um, in the fall and you can collect those. Um, I do have a post on my feed about those. So you can learn more about those there. So this is a really um, neat plant. In fact, when I, before I unpackaged this plant, I noticed a fungus knot flying around under the a little hood. Um, here's a video of that. And, uh, you know, know that no matter how good the grower, occasionally you're going to have little hitchhikers. It's almost impossible to, you know, not sometimes have a little stray fungus gnat or something come along. So it's always a good idea to inspect your plants. But luckily, we're talking about a carnivorous plant that has sticky traps. And sure enough, let's see if I can get a good focus on this. This plant went ahead and trapped that little fungus gnat for me before I ever, here you go, you can you can see it right there, before I ever took it out. So a handy little tip, if you have a fungus gnat problem, uh, a few little uh, sundews, just any of the species of sundews or other sticky trap type uh, passive uh, trap carnivorous plants can be a handy way to uh, employ some natural pest control measures. The next 
species, well, it's the same species. This is um, also Drosera scorpioides, except this is a variety, um, a, a localized, a locally occurring variety called Gijginup. Um, I think that is how you pronounce that, Gijginup. Someone please correct me if I am wrong, but this is an area, a town um, in Australia. I believe it's near Perth, Australia, um, that this particular variety of the species is found. And um, you can certainly dig into uh, uh, my book, Plant Parenting, if you want a little more explanation on some basic plant nomenclature and, and kind of what the difference is between a, a, a naturally occurring variety and cultivars, et cetera. So, so my understanding is this is um, just a localized variation of Drosera scorpioides that's found in kitchen up so it's going to have a similar um similar growth habit but the the traps look a little bit larger um to me i'm not exactly sure the specific morphological or anatomical differences of this variety but in in my experience the the uh, traps tend to look a little bit bigger the plant seems a little bit even more giant than the than the parent species but um, i could be wrong about that but if someone wants to to chime in there, that would be great. And this Gijginup has also caught itself a little fungus now uh, in transit. So yeah, food to go. The next species is an itty bitty called Drosera callistos. This particular uh, plant is a cultivar called uh, Brookton large form and it is called that, obviously not because of the size of the plant. So you'll see this species has very, very tiny rosettes, unlike the Drosera scorbioides that has sort of a little tiny tall tree form. These are gonna form really beautiful little um, kind of rosy red rosettes. The cool thing about this cultivar is that it produces really large orange blooms, really beautiful blooms. And that's one of the cool things about pygmy sundew is that flower size for many of the species relative to plant size is pretty dramatic. So an individual flower of this cultivar is gonna be about as big as the rosette. And you know, orange is pretty much my favorite flower color. I'm kind of obsessed with anything orange or peachy colored um, blooms. So I, I tend to collect those. So I'm excited to have um, this cultivar. And you can see the profile of these mature little uh, rosettes of uh, Drosera callistos. Super cute. Next up is a really uh, pretty little species called Drosera halodes. Um, this is another big bloomer, and as you can see, also forming very tiny little rosettes. The large um, blooms are pale pink. So, you know, these are um, pretty large. This, the scape itself can be really tall, I think around three or four inches tall. The, the flowers, again, are going to be almost as big as the rosette of the plant itself. So very pretty. Um, I don't see this species up very often uh, uh, for, for availability. So I think it's considered a little bit more rare in uh, collecting. Of course, any of the really tiny uh, pygmy sundews that throw really large flowers are, are going to be, you know, some of the more popular ones to collect. Next up is another cultivar. This is a species called Drosera inotis. The cultivar is Scott's River. Um, here's a profile you can see. This has a little bit of a taller growth habit, kind of like the scorpioides, but but tinier on a much smaller scale. Um, again, the plant rosettes or, or, or diameter will be about the size of the dime. The flowers on this plant are, are a little less conspicuous. They're smaller, kind of whitish uh, blooms, but still very pretty. I don't believe that these self, I think they have to outcross with another individual. So if you happen to have uh, a couple of plants blooming, uh, at the same time that, and you want to get seed, then you're going to want to cross pollinate these uh, for seed setting. However, uh, they'll produce gemmae, the little vegetative propagules, 
uh, fall, winter, um, I believe that you can do vegeta vegetative propagation with. So these have a, a cute little tall silhouette. You can see the traps there. I don't see any fungus gnats in this one, but I'll bet you I've got a few here in my office that it can snag for me. Really cute. Last but not least is Drosera palacea. This is a variety or cultivar. I'm not exactly sure whether it's a variety or considered it a cultivar. I'll have to do a little bit more research. Um, that is, it's called giant because it is apparently larger than the parent species. So the parent species for Drosera palacea, even tinier than this specimen here, but really lovely little rosettes and you can see the nice little round traps. The The flowers of this uh, variety um, and species are, are tiny, they're not big, they're tiny white flowers, but they look really cool because the inflorescence um, are kind of stacked with lots of little buds that range in color and the flowers are slightly fragrant as well. So this is a fun um, species and this particular variety called giant is fun to collect. I like to collect different species of pygmy sundews that have completely different types of flowers because it is kind of fun when they're all blooming and, and you get different flower types, uh, shapes, and, and colors. And of course, you know, getting flowers does provide you the opportunity to do a little bit of hand pollination uh, and get some seeds sometimes. Uh, of course, my favorite way to propagate uh, pygmy sundews is Gemma, just because um, they're they're so fun to collect and really um, cute to grow. And, and really there's almost nothing cuter than a tiny, brand new baby pygmy sundew that has sprouted um, from either a seed or a gemma with the the the, the new uh, propagules um, that form from the little gemma the little clones are look just like the mature plant but they are minuscule and they're just adorable so if, if that's if you want to try a, an interesting plant propagation project um, propagating uh, sundew gemma are, uh, that's kind of a really cool, unique thing to do. It's good to know that carnivorous plants in general are pretty sensitive to the type of water and any added fertilizers that you may use. I only water my carnivorous plants, especially my itty bitty specimens with rainwater that I've collected, which is essentially a type of distilled water distilled water or if you really want to get fancy um ro water reverse osmosis your reverse osmosis water is going to be completely neutral with no dissolved salts uh, no nutrients no soluble salts in it whatsoever distilled water can have a, a little bit um rain water can also have other things in it it can it can potentially pick things up on its way down it can pick up nitrates um, nitrogen compounds in the atmosphere um, so it can have some soluble salts in it. It can pick things up off of your roof if you're collecting in rain barrels. Uh, it can have some biologics in it. So, you know, rainwater is still better than tap water for sure when it comes to your sensitive carnivorous plants. But just, you know, if you really are want to be careful about it, you can use distilled water or RO water. Um, generally, these little pygmy sundews are going to sit in water trays of a couple of inches wa of water at all times. However, that does change seasonally, so you have to get to know each species and what its um, kind of wet and dry cycles are uh, for when it wants to rest and you want to pull back some water. So always research the species that you're growing to get specific um, management regimens for them when it comes to things like light and water. These little tiny pygmy sundews do like bright light. They like sunlight. So you really want to have a very, you know, kind of bright, sunnier window. I usually grow them on grow shelves with some um, low wattage supplemental LED grow lights. Um, if they're getting too much light, you know, they, they'll, they'll get very sort of orangey red, you know, from light stress. So you can back off your supplemental lighting a little bit if they start to turn too orangey or red in color. But I don't have uh, too much time to get into too much of the care. You can check out a little bit more info in my book, Tiny Plants. And of course, you know, get online with uh, California carnivores or any of the other great carnivorous plant vendors out there and, and pick up a lot of handy tips and information. 
If you're really a big plant nerd like me and you happen to be a member of the International Carnivorous Plant Society, um, the December 22 issue of the publication has this great article on um, reproductive biology of cephalotis. If you love cephalotis, which are little have little pictures. Um, there is some really cool imagery in the article of the cephalotis growing from seed, a, a germinating seed. So if you really want to nerd out, um, you can join the International Carnivorous Plant Society like me and get all sorts of cool nerdy plant information about carnivorous plants like itty bitty tiny pygmy sundews.